I don't know if you know the background to that song we just sang. The guy Matt Redman, uh, pastor, um, loves music and has written so many wonderful worship songs. His church was going down a path of focusing on, on music, focusing on, on lyrics, focusing on feeling. And it got to a point where he was really challenged by scripture. And he put an end for a month, or maybe even more, I can't remember, to music at all. He just had the word, and he says, we need to get back to where God is speaking to us in our hearts, that he's doing something drastic in our hearts, that it's not about our emotion, it's not about how we feel, but it's about what we know. And they actually cut worship. They cut singing, totally. They prayed, and they had the word. And that was it. And he wrote that song out of that experience. He was, so, he was so devastated by what he saw was happening, not only in his own heart's heart, but in everybody else's hearts as well. And um, I think it's a good place to start this morning, is that we can crowd out our Sunday morning with all kinds of wonderful things, having cups of coffee, um, uh, fellowship, um, morning prayer time. But if God's word isn't proclaimed and proclaimed straight from his word, straight to our hearts, that the Holy Spirit can use it to change us forever, then we're just playing a game. Then it's just, it's really not the heart of worship anymore. It's my heart. It's not God's heart. So would you join with me as, 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 as I pray and We just really focus on what God wants to speak to us about this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we want to get back to your heart, the heart of true worship, which is worshiping you, giving glory to you. Lord, we are people who can so easily take things and and convert them and change them into things that is more about us than about you. And so... Lord, this morning, we want to bring it back. Bring it back to what you want from us, not what we want. Lord Jesus, your word is a guide for us. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a place in stormy times that we can find refuge. It's that rock that we can stand on when everything else is sinking. Lord, I pray that as people who are called according to your name, we would would so focus on your word, so focus on your spirits working through that word to transform our lives into something that is Christ-like. Lord, we can't do this on our own. We need your word. We need a touch from you. We need you to transform us. So, Lord, here we are. Creating us. Christ Jesus. Amen. We come to a place in... In James, in this, this wonderful letter that he writes to those people dispersed all over the Roman Empire, um, that is kind of damning of every single one of us. I don't think there's a person in here that hasn't changed feet in their mouths from time to time. I know I'm constantly, I've got this horrible um, foot taste in my mouth because I put my foot in it every single day, every single moment. It's so easy for us to do it. It's, it's natural. It's, it's kind of who we are. Our base, our base nature is to defend ourselves and to, and to put somebody else in a much lower position than us so that we can feel like we are um, people who are above everybody else, above reproach, above being uh, wrong. And our lips betray, uh, betray us all the time. Donna, thank you for reading that passage um, And it talks about taming the tongue, taming the tongue. So if you've got your Bibles, please open them to James 3, 1 to 12, and keep it there. The tongue has incredible power. But you see, the tongue gets the blame 
but the heart is the culprit. The tongue gets the blame, but the heart is the culprit. There's no way that you can speak just, just your tongue knowing what you're saying. But whatever bubbles forth from the heart, the mouth speaks. And that betrays us. Listen to a couple of Bible verses um, regarding the tongue. I want to do, just have a look at a couple of verses to give us a baseline. And then we'll get into, into the passage. Uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 10. Whoever would love life and see good days, must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. If you want a good life, if you want a life that is pleasing to God, if you want a life that that is cherished by most people around you, then the tongue has to be reined in. Keep your tongue from evil. It is so easy for our tongues to to speak evil, not only of others, but, but but, but just of the Lord. It's so easy for us to, if we're in a place of, 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 of um, people that don't like Jesus and, and hate him, to, to not speak up when they have um, committed blasphemy. It's so easy for our lips to have deceitful speech on it. Not only about God, but about our brothers and sisters, about our, 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 our kids, about our parents, about our spouse about our friends, deceitful speech. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. How often do we coarse joke? Do we tell a joke and, 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 and we've all got them that is just kind of borderline or just stepping over? And we know, before it's left our lips, we know that that was the wrong thing to do, but yet we do it. And God longs for our, 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 our voices, our, our, our tongues to be full of grace, uplifting, upbuilding of others. But it's so, so easy to break down. It says seasoned with salt. What does salt do? Salt brings wonderful flavor to every meal that you eat. You know what? You, you get that meal and it's so bland. It's got no spices, it's got nothing in. And I love spicy meals. And then you just put a little bit of salt on it. And all of a sudden, the flavor of the meal is changed. It's wonderful. That, that juicy piece of steak that you put some... some <laughs> I can see you guys like your steak. And you put that salt on. And you, and you cut it through. And, and the juices and the blood is... No. And the blood's running off of it. And you put it in your mouth. And that taste. Oh! Jesus wants our words to be seasoned with that same salt. Uplifting, upbuilding, natural to what it should be. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Any unwholesome talk, anything. It doesn't specifically say what it must be, but if it's unwholesome, don't let it come out of your mouth. Done deal. Only that which is uplifting and upbuilding of one another. Proverbs 10 verse 19 says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. When words are many, when when you've got somebody who just babbles and babbles and babbles, it's so easy for disdain and gossip and evil to come out. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Whoever holds their tongue and listens and listens, does the right thing. Proverbs 15, 28 says, The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. The, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers. How does he weigh it? He weighs it according to who Christ Jesus is, what Christ has done in his life. He weighs it according to the life of Christ and seeing that that's his standard, not his neighbor. That Christ is the standard, not your spouse. That Christ is the standard, not the person that that is lower, that you think is lower than you. They weigh their answers. But the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. You can just imagine this this water, this, 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 this horrible water gushing from a person's mouth. Just evil, wicked. And then Jesus' words which is really striking. And this speaks volumes. 
Matthew 15 verse 11 says, What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. And what comes out of the mouth comes from the place of reason, the place of, 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 of thinking, the place of making decisions. We call it the heart. It comes from the very, the very place that we judge things. 1 Peter 3 verse 10 is, 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 is so important. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. As you can see from a number of these scriptures, our tongue and our lips can get us into so much trouble. But more than that, our hearts are wells of malice and deceit. Imagine a well that's been dug in a very dry place and they come down to the last bucket of water. What's left down there is sludge. And that's the, that's the imprint here. Is that sludge comes out. Malice, deceit. James knows this. And he knows that it is a problem in believers in the first century, but we also know that it's a problem today. It's not something that's just far back 2,000 years ago. We know that at the very heart of each one of us, if we're left to our own devices, that malice and deceit comes out, that sludge, that horrible, uh, gritty stuff that's at the bottom that you can't drink, you can't stomach. You put it to your lips and you just want to bring up. It's horrible. I suffer from foot and mouth disease. I speak before I think, and it gets me into all kinds of trouble. So what does James have to say about the tongue? What does he say about our, our speech? James starts off with people who use their tongues regularly. Those who teach, have a look at it. He says that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness than anyone else. Don't, don't, don't think that you must become a teacher if you're not able to get yourself right. If you're not able to be obedient to God. Don't speak. Shut up. Why would that be? Well, one, teachers have greater influence. What they say from this pulpit carries a lot of weight because they claim to speak on God's behalf. That's what they claim. Number two, they have greater responsibility. God has given me a much greater responsibility than any of you sitting here. I've got to proclaim his word, and I've got to proclaim it rightly. And if I don't, there is judgment that awaits me. They have a higher profile. Myself in community, people know that I'm a pastor. They know at the, 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 the soccer club that I coach at, they know what I do for a living. And so if I don't act accordingly, they pull me up. And that's, and that's a good thing. Imagine being pulled up by a non-believer. <laughs> You're not supposed to be acting that way, Bruce. Why did you say that? And I'm like, thank you. I shouldn't be. You're right. Number four. They are entrusted with the gospel. God has entrusted me with the gospel. As a preacher, as a pastor, in a position to be either an instrument of God to change lives or an instrument of Satan to hinder or confuse people. What do I choose as a pastor? What does God want from me? What does he desire from me? Is to speak on his behalf. That's what he desires, to be obedient above all else. And Satan's so subtle. He doesn't barge in and demand things of you. He will be gentle in the way he uses you to destroy lives. Usually something that is close to your heart or something that he's, you're, you're passionate about. He'll take that and he'll use it in so many ways to destroy not only your life, but other people's lives as well. Notice in verse 2, James says, we all stumble in many ways. Yes, pastors, you've got to watch your mouth. But remember, congregation, we all stumble in many ways. Not one person here can say that I haven't stumbled this week. If you have, man, I want to learn from you. I really do. 
We all are sinners according to Romans 3.23. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is exempt. There was one person that, was, that is exempt from that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, who never put a foot wrong. We all stumble in many ways, ways that seem right, but eventually show us up. Our thoughts, our attitudes, our deeds, what we do, our motives, we stumble and stumble and stumble. And if if we don't come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness and ask for correction, we're going to make the same mistake and repeat it over and over. If we all stumble and all are sinners, does the perfect person exist? I don't think so. Regardless of where you go in this world, regardless of what church you belong to, sinners are part of that church. Notice that when you say um, it has an effect on your, uh, it has an effect on your body. Bridle the tongue, you bridle the whole body. Control your speech, you control the whole body. Let's go a step further. Bridle the heart. You bridle the tongue. You bridle the body. So, yeah, we talk about this this little little muscle that's in your mouth, but it's that bigger, bigger place. Are we able to tame our tongues if our hearts are not brought into line? No, not at all. There's no way we can bridle our tongue because from the heart, the mouth speaks. It's an overflow Jeremiah 17 verse 9 is so important. So, so important. Understand this. This is the baseline of the sermon today. The heart is deceitful above all else. And beyond cure, who can understand it? Jeremiah back in the Old Testament knew all about it. He knew from his own speech that he he wouldn't be able to speak right if God hadn't transformed his very heart. Genesis 6 verse 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent and thought of the heart was only evil continually. (laughs) That's back in Genesis. Has anything changed? No, we just find new and better ways to be deceitful and to pour forth evil. This is written by Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit. At the dawn of time, has anything changed? No. Jesus speaking in Mark 7, 20 to 23 says, That which proceeds out of a man, that is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart, proceed proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of, of covetousness, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within that defile a man. So that piece of steak, that piece of bacon, that cup of coffee, that's not going to change you. But our base nature, our base evil nature, the nature of Adam when he sinned is in in us today. That's what pours forth evil in each one of us. James then uh, takes the example from the world we live in and wants to drive the point home. He says, number one, bits into horses' mouths, small but controls the whole horse. That little bit. Have you ever taken a bit? Um, Alan, you must bring one one day. And we put it in your mouth. (laughs) Uh, Sterile, of course. And, um, And just put it around and just feel how uncomfortable that is. I see these horses and they're constantly chewing. It would be so annoying to have that kind of thing. But imagine a bit in a horse's mouth controls the whole horse. doesn't matter how big that horse is. You pull left, it goes left. You pull right, it goes right. You pull back, it stops. Small, but it controls the whole horse. Ships and rudders, they are so small, the rudder, compared to the ship. But even the big tankers, they take a couple of kilometers to turn, but they do turn. And that little, little rudder has got such a big effect on the ship itself. Verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. We all know people who can talk up a storm. They never stop talking about their achievements, their status, their goals, their passions, their children, how great they are, etc., 
Our tongues are small, yet boasts of great things. James then compares the destruction of a fire to the boasts of a tongue. A huge blaze is sparked for a small fire. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. On the 7th of February 2009, we had Black Saturday, a fires in Victoria, sparked from a small little flame. Raged right through, burnt 450,000 hectares of land. A number of people were killed. Fire can be so wonderful if it's contained in an area. It can provide heat, prepare your food on it, light, protection. But out of control, total destruction and devastation. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. The tongue has an incredible effect on the whole body. Even though it is such a small muscle, it stains the whole body. You can try and keep your hands clean, your your body clean, free from all kinds of evil. But if your tongue says something, it is gone. I don't know if you have met someone who is extremely beautiful physically. You see these these amazing, amazing models on TV. And these these girls and even guys are are just, they've got these physiques and they, they, you know, they just, they've got all the makeup and the hair and, 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 and wow, just incredible. I don't know if you've met somebody like that and as soon as they open their mouths, you take a step back and all of a sudden that external beauty is dulled by the internal evil. Next part of verse 6, setting on fire the entire cause, course of life. People's lives are ruined by their tongues. Destruction and mayhem uh, cause through uh, their whole lives. Entire course of life. Such a small part of the body, yet it destroys and has such great influence over the whole body and over so many people. Notice where the fire originates from. It originates from hell itself. Satan wants to destroy every part of a believer's life constantly. He wants to push you into a place where your speech will be so unhelpful and unwholesome that you don't keep it in check. James changes metaphors and wants to drive home the point about how bad the tongue can be. Every kind of animal, wild animal, can be tamed. And he goes into to list them. Birds, reptiles, sea creatures can be tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. They have tried and carry on trying. But it's impossible. You have tried. I have but I can't tame that tongue. I can't bridle it. It's like a fire in our mouths, setting the world ablaze. It's like a ferocious tiger looking to devour everything it sees. James goes on to say that he is like a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Its every intent is to do harm, sow destruction, promote evil in this world. Verse 9, with the same tongue we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessing and curse. Have you found that in your own life we are barely finished with the service? We barely uh, saying amen and we go and we grab a cup of coffee. We declare our love for God and in the next breath we gossip over a cup of coffee about someone who has done something wrong to us. I've done it. I've praised God the one moment and cursed my brothers and sisters the next. James says that, that, that they are made in the image of God. That we are cursing something that God created for his glory. Created for a love relationship with him. And we defile his image in them. Evil comes gushing out of our mouths. James explains this ought, ought not to be so. God does not want uh, uh, this in our lives. We are better than that. 
If God has saved us through Jesus, redeemed us, bought us with his blood, that incredible sacrifice, we are his and should act accordingly. How can a spring pour forth fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree bear olives and grapes? Uh, 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 bear olives and, and a grapevine produce figs. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. All these things totally opposite to what they should be and what they should produce. It should not be so, my brothers and sisters. Look at your life. We are saved by God's grace to do good works which he's prepared beforehand for us to do. Good works, not evil ones. Obedience to him, not importance to ourselves. So let's return to scripture that gives us the source of our evil tongue. Remember Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all else and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Yes, your heart is beyond all cure. Understand that. Understand that we need a heart transplant, that this, this, this a place of knowledge, the place of understanding that is within us needs to be transformed. And how does it get transformed? By God's word through his Holy Spirit, prompting us moment by moment. Think before you talk. Those thoughts that are going through your mind, think about them. Before you open your mouth, think. There's nothing more wicked than the heart. Our hearts have a bent towards evil, not towards good. Our hearts are are like a magnet for destruction. Our hearts need to change, and we are powerless to change it. Only God is able to transform us. Only only He is able to take our hearts and and take them from that that piece of stone, that, that rock, and change it into something that's a throne of God. Understand that we are powerless to do it. And if you think that you can do it, I'd love to hear from you. King David was known as a man whose heart was fully after God. Yet what did he do? He committed adultery. He committed murder. A man after God's own heart. Psalm 51 is an account of Nathan pointing the finger at King David and saying, you are the guilty one. And that's exactly what God will do do to us. If we continue to use our tongues not to give him glory, but to break down and to cause havoc. We are the guilty ones. We stand guilty, condemned before a holy God. How do we get rid of the guilt? Well, through repentance. What does that mean? It means going to Jesus and saying, Lord, I am sorry for the words that I've used to break people down. I need help to to keep my speech wholesome. Help me. Show me through Scripture. Show me through your Holy Spirit. Prompt me. May your Holy Spirit be my conscience and guide that grabs me on the shoulder and pulls me in the right direction. Only he can do it. No human being is able to do it. Let God's healing power come in and transform your life to be more like Christ. Just remember that we are a work in progress, that God is busy working on us, but only if we'll let him. If we don't want him to do anything, he will not barge in and impose himself on you. But he longs, he so longs for you to be transformed into the image of Jesus. To be like Jesus, each one of us, for his glory. In the great high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed, he talked about how every single one of them that had been given to him, he has kept. Are you one of those people that are in Christ's hands? Is he keeping you or are you going on your own way? You've got a decision to make. Joshua made that decision. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. I don't care what comes against us, but we will serve the Lord. How about you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to serve you. Sometimes our, our hearts long for that, but, but most of the times we, we, we just end up doing our own thing. Father, we are so thankful that you've given us scripture, that you've given us our, our memory verse. Oh, Lord, 
your steadfast love never ceases. Mercies never come to end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Oh, what a beautiful promise. You are faithful and you will always be. Help us turn to you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.